How's everybody doing today? Good. Good, good. Definitely appreciate you guys coming out today. It's an honor and privilege to be here to hear Ryan Hoff Swami speak today. I mean, when you do the research on this guy, you see how he walks and lives his life, his daily values. I mean, this is a guy that we all should emulate. We should all want to strive to be like. And, you know, I, I definitely apply these to my everyday walks in life because the power of the mind and positivity, it can take you so much further than any negative thought. So I'm excited to be here and hearing him speak for the first time in person. And I hope that all of y'all are excited as well. Thank you again. So I've actually uh, read Journey Home. I'm about three quarters through Journey Within. And it is one of the most powerful spiritual works that I have ever read. Uh, I've been 45 years on the spiritual path and actually known of Radhanath Swami that long. He is unquestionably a living saint. And when you read that book, you realize that the person, the author, not only speaks spirituality, he totally lives it. And he's lived as a celibate monk for over 45 years. He's also a spiritual guide to thousands of people worldwide. And he does so much incredible work in India with a hospital, orphanage, with school children, and one of the most successful eco-villages uh, in existence on planet Earth today. With great pleasure, I'd like you all to welcome and maybe give him a standing ovation. By the way, the book is number two in the religion section of New York Times. His Holiness. Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Sunyavadi Asjatyate Satharine Manchakal Madhurubhyascha Kripa Sindhubhya Evacha Patithanam Avanibhya Vaishnavebhyo namo namah Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Adwait Gadadhar Shivasati Kaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hari Hari I am very grateful to be with all of you this evening. Although I 
can't see anyone. <laughs> I'm quite accustomed to doing things in darkness in my life. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Special gratitude to Mark Torzai and to Yummy Pace and to Harper Maltz and Harish Saluja <clears throat> and to each and every one of you. Today is Father's Day. Recently, it was Mother's Day. They are days that are, hold, are held sacred because they are opportunities to express our gratitude. A mother and father who perform their responsibilities properly they nourish us, protect us in our most helpless phase of life. By providing food, by providing shelter, by giving an example, spiritual faith and inspiration, we are nourished. It is said that gratitude is a fertilizer that puts the heart in a condition wherein the seed of love can grow very nicely and naturally. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna tells, Aham Bija Pratapada. Aham Sarvasya Prabhupo Matta Sarvam Prabhartate. That the original mother and father of all living beings, the supreme source of everything that exists, Jagmadhya Shagataha, who has many names, who has appeared in many ways over the ages. In our tradition, we call Krishna. We are speaking of God, the Supreme Being. The Supreme Father and Mother Nature nourish us with everything we have. To be grateful to reciprocate with the love we are receiving is really the essence of yoga or religion. Just as a little baby is completely dependent on the mother and father, in a similar way, however wealthy or however powerful, Whatever our age, we are completely dependent on the grace of the power beyond ourselves, for the air we breathe, for the sunshine, for the rain, for the earth and all of the grains and fruits and vegetables we receive. Mother's Day, Father's Day, it's a time when we honor our particular mother and father. In one sense, all those who have helped us in our life. And we give honor and gratitude to that supreme mother and father. As mothers or fathers, from a spiritual perspective, we are caretakers of sacred property. We see our child as God's child in our care. 
we see our property, our wealth, our strength, our skills as God's sacred property entrusted in our care. And we're grateful. When I was young, my father, he really worked hard to try to provide for us. Through his example and through his economic efforts, I remember he invested all of his wealth. He took huge risks, many loans to start a business. <laughs> I was about eight years old. Within two years, he went into total bankruptcy. He lost everything. Have any of you heard of the Edsel? He was the largest Edsel dealer in the Midwest. <clears throat> we were about to lose our home. He had nothing except debts. He struggled and worked from early morning till late night trying to somehow or other maintain us. And I remember he would tell me that what's really valuable in life is not our money or property. It's the love that we share for one another. That's all that's really important. I asked him, if that's what you believe, then why are you always working so hard for money? <laughs> he said, I have to do that too. It's a way of performing my responsibility of showing my love to you. But it's the love that is our true wealth. When I was 15 years old, to try to help the family, I got a job at a car wash. In those days, car washes were like an assembly line of people who would wash every inch of the car by hand. <clears throat> and except for one of my friends, everyone who was working in that car wash was from the inner city of Chicago. They were about my father's age and they were really struggling in their lives. But they taught me how to wash cars so good. <laughs> the first time I ever came to Pittsburgh, it was in 1972. My spiritual father, Srila Prabhupada, was speaking at the Syrian mosque. Is that still here? No. He was living in a house for a few days, and the first day I came, somebody made an announcement that Srila Prabhupada's car is really dirty. <laughs> is there anybody who knows how to wash cars? <laughs> and I was thinking, that's why my father went bankrupt. <laughs> so that I could learn how to wash cars. And I raised my hand and I said, I'm a professional car washer. <laughs> so they said, well, you wash his car. But it was just sitting there in a driveway and there was nothing there. And in the car washes, you have all these different facilities. But somehow or other, I really, really used everything I learned, and I cleaned the inside and the outside, and I washed it, and I, and I was shining it at the end. It took me hours, I was all alone. And when I just finished, my spiritual father, Shiva Prabhupada, he was in the second floor in his bedroom, and he looked out the window, and I just noticed that he was watching me. And he looked at the shiny car. And he took note of how I was just trying to do my very best. 
and he smiled. He smiled and he nodded his head as if to say thank you. And I felt so happy. This principle that real happiness is not in taking from people we love, but especially in giving to the people we love. In Mumbai, we have a hospital called the Bhaktivedanta Hospital. And every year we go to a place called Barasana, a very holy place, to perform these cataract eye camps. Because in India, most blindness comes from untreated cataracts. Because people simply cannot afford a surgery. So there's millions of people that go blind. We have about 200 volunteers, and we go to this really rustic, rural little village area, and these doctors who live in beautiful apartments and make so much earnings in their profession, they leave everything to come for several weeks to live in this cold, rainy, muddy, primitive little village to do surgeries and other volunteering work. So one particular doctor, very highly respected, somehow or other he was convinced, I'm making so much, I should give something back to society. So he performed one surgery, many, but I'll tell you about one in particular. It was this old village lady. She was probably in her 80s, but she looked like she was about 100. She was wearing rags. She lived in some distant village where everyone is in extreme poverty. Has he took the bandage off of her eye <coughs> after the surgery. She could see for the first time in years. She was so happy. She started in her very simple way slapping the doctor on the top of his head. <laughs> really hard. <laughs> she was slapping him again and again, and she was saying, May Radharani give you her love. May Radharani give you her love. Radharani is the female aspect of, of God in that area. That is where she lives. It's, it's the holy place of pilgrimage for her. She was beating him on the head, giving him blessing. This doctor was crying. He said it was the deepest, most moving experience of his life. After that, every year he comes and brings his whole family. The origin of this principle is our very inner nature. Ananda Mayo Vyashat. Everyone is looking for pleasure. Whether we're a little ant crawling on a kitchen cabinet, or whether we're a CEO of a major corporation, everyone is seeking pleasure. Things could give some pleasure to the mind and to the bodily senses but things can never give fulfillment to the heart. There is only one thing that brings that fulfillment, to love and to be loved. A little baby, or let us say a little girl, the parents could give her 
nice garments, nice ornaments, but if they don't give her love, she, she looks pretty, but lives in misery. Ultimately, that is our nature. Where does that come from? The Bhagavad Gita explains that the nature of life, the nature of true happiness, is on the spiritual level. I remember years ago, when I was roaming, looking for truth, while in the Himalayan jungle, I lived with a yogi whose name was Kailash Baba. He was probably in his 60s or 70s. <clears throat> At the time, I believe I was 19 or 20. He taught me how to live in the jungle, what to eat, what not to eat. What herbs were good for different types of diseases, which I was getting a lot. How to mix with other wandering sadhus or seekers. That was really challenging. And he taught me how to live peacefully with our neighbors. The neighbors were leopards, wild elephants, cobras, vipers, scorpions, wild boar, lots of mosquitoes. And when we would go to sleep at night under a tree in a wilderness forest, we were completely vulnerable to our neighbors. And he taught me, if you have any arrogance that you are superior to them, they will kill you. And if you have any fear of them, they will kill you. Now how to live in that situation where you're going to go to sleep peacefully? <laughs> he explained, we have to see the true essential nature of the soul. What is that source of life that is within all of us? Who am I? We are not this body. We are living in the body. The body is always changing. From childhood to adolescence to old age. And ultimately, there's death. But for the soul, there is no death. The Bhagavad Gita tells that for the living force, the soul, there is neither birth nor death. We are eternal. And we're part of God. And our nature is to love. Our nature is to experience the limitless love and grace of God and to be an instrument of that grace in whatever we do. We're all brothers and sisters. But we can only truly understand that when we understand who we really are. In his company, because he had that realization, I really was seeing leopards who were roaming about the forest and a lot of snakes. I was seeing them as my brothers and sisters. 
I was trying to see them not as their body, but as the conscious force that's seeing through their eyes and tasting through their tongues and hearing through their ears. It really works. I was fearless. Not because I was enlightened, but because I was with this person who had such fearlessness and who had convinced me of that. And from that experience, it's not something where you practice for some time and then you're tested. Because the first day I was learning it, all of these animals and snakes were all around. Bhagavad Gita tells Vidyavanaya Sampane Brahmani Gavihasti. The true wisdom is to understand the equality of all beings. Whether one is white or black or red or yellow or brown in color, male or female, whether one is from the east or the west, rich or poor, whether one is a Hindu or a Muslim or a Jew or a Christian or a Jain or a Parsi or a Buddhist or a Zoroastrian or an agnostic or an atheist, whether one is a human or an elephant or a dog or a cat or a cow, wherever there's life, it is sacred. When we understand the sacredness within ourselves, we can appreciate and recognize that sacredness in all others. Mamai vamsa jiva loke jiva buddha sanatana. That we are all a part of the Supreme. When you put water on the root of a tree, that water naturally extends to every part of the tree the branches, the twigs, the flowers, the leaves. And similarly, when we awaken that love within our hearts, when the cloud of ego dissipates through the sincerity of our lifestyle and our spiritual practice, then the grace of God shines. The love of God shines upon us and we reflect that love in whatever we do. This is a universal principle. In the Bible, Lord Jesus tells that the first and great commandment is to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And what is the expression of that love while we're living in this world. We love our neighbor as ourself. And everyone is our neighbor. Mother Nature is our neighbor. All living beings. Years ago, not so long, I was in the Muir Woods in Northern California, where enormous redwood trees are growing. Some of them are thousands of years old. And I happened to hear a forest ranger speak about the underground secret of the redwood trees. Now coming from the 1960s, I'm really inclined toward underground secrets. <laughs> so I stopped to listen. He explained that in these woods, over the centuries, there has been enormous, devastating earthquakes. Massive windstorms, snowstorms, rainstorms, 
the roots of the redwood trees don't grow so deep. How do they keep growing higher and higher? The largest trees on the planet. He explained that the roots of the redwood trees, they grow slightly underground outward, reaching for the roots of other trees. As soon as two trees' roots meet, they embrace each other. They wrap around and make a permanent knot. In this way, all the roots of the trees are reaching out to unite with the roots of other trees. <coughs> Directly or indirectly, every tree in the forest is supporting each other. And it is that united care, how they share each other's strength, that they can keep growing even in the greatest challenges. The little tiny redwoods, their roots are like threads. But they wrap, they wrap around the enormous roots of the ancient giants. And they all give support to one another. Mother Nature is teaching us in this beautiful analogy that our strength is in our unity. Our strength is in understanding that our greatest responsibility is to be caretakers for one another. That's a spiritual principle. And like that old lady who was beating that professional doctor on the head, Say, may God bless you. He became enlightened by that. He realized that all his selfish greed was pale in comparison to actually helping someone else and receiving God's blessings. In Sanskrit, there is a word, karuna, which is sometimes translated as compassion. Active, directed, intelligent, determined compassion. Not just a sentiment, but an inner experience that inspires outward action. That is compassion. My guru, Srila Prabhupada, he used to give us a beautiful verse from the Vedas. <coughs> Within it is the words, Paratuka Dukhi. That true enlightenment is when Another person's happiness is my happiness. And another person's suffering is my suffering. To have that experience is real knowledge. That is where true inner fulfillment can be realized and expressed. Srila Prabhupada came to the West 50 years ago. When he was at the first place he came in 1965, let me tell you how he came. He was living in the holiest place for devotees of Krishna in India. It's called Vrindavan. There's over 5,000 temples thousands of ashrams, and it's in forest and pastures on the banks of the Yamuna River. 
Millions and millions of people come there on pilgrimage every year. He was living very peacefully, but he left there for Calcutta and took a cargo ship 38 days. He was 70 years old when he was on that ship. He had heart attacks. He had seasickness. He didn't have any money. He didn't know a single person in America. And the first place he came was Butler, Pennsylvania. <laughs> City, just somebody met him, a stranger, and put him on a bus to Pittsburgh. And in Pittsburgh, one of his acquaintances' his son picked him up at the bus station and drove him to Butler. So this is a very holy place for us. <laughs> <laughs> and when he was in the West, in New York, somebody challenged him, why have you come to our country? We have our own religion, we have our own society. He said, I have not come to convert you. I've come to enlighten you. I've simply come to remind you of what so many have forgotten. That our real happiness is in awakening that inner love for God that's within us and learning how to be a compassionate instrument of that love. Now in 1965-1966, the counterculture was very prevalent in the Lower East Side where he was living, in the Bowery. He was just going from place to place. He was kind of homeless. But he could see in everyone's heart that spiritual potential. He saw a spark. And no matter whatever, whatever bad habits a person may have, he focused on that little spark of divinity that was within us. And he tried to fan that. And by fanning that spark of divinity that is within all of us, it becomes a blazing fire and gives light and removes all of our negative habits. By that example, I learned so much and so many tens of thousands of people were inspired with this principle of karuna or compassion. It's the essence of all great spiritual paths. Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh are actually holy places. <laughs> what is holiness? What is spiritual and what is material? Potentially everything is spiritual if we understand its connection with God. An example, a knife in the hands of a thief will be used to kill someone. That same knife in the hands of a surgeon will save a person's life. Is the knife material or spiritual? Is it good or bad? It depends on our perception and how we use it. Whether we are doctors or lawyers or in business, students, entertainers, teachers, priests or swamis, we all have an opportunity to use our skills as caretakers. 
with gratitude, seeing the positive opportunities in all situations of how to grow and how to share. Srila Prabhupada wrote that a person's greatness is how they respond to very difficult testing circumstances. For that we need a strong spiritual foundation. The Bible tells if you build a house on shifting sand, it may look nice, but when a storm comes, it collapses. But if you build that house on firm rocks, that foundation will hold it up, even in the storms. So in this world we live, whoever we are, storms, temptations, fears, crisis, tragedies, they come for everyone. The world is always changing. When I washed my teacher's car here in Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh was very famous for its steel mills. I guess that's why you're the Pittsburgh Steelers. <laughs> but now, the only Steelers that I am aware of in Pittsburgh are on your football team. <laughs> so from those massive steel mills that were providing steel for the whole country, now there's banking, technology, healthcare, education. Things are always changing in this world. The body's always changing. The mind's always changing. Circumstances are always changing. There's honor and dishonor, happiness and distress, pleasure and pain, success and failure, victory and defeat, health and disease, birth and death. These dualities are everywhere. But if we have a strong spiritual foundation, then through all these dualities, we can sustain a true fulfillment. We can always be equipped to grow, whatever the circumstance. And that is what is called the journey within. If we have inner fulfillment, that fulfillment, that love within us is the foundation. And it is the greatest opportunity in life to cultivate and to develop that inner foundation. And then build our life upon that foundation. Whatever our particular professional or social status may be. In our tradition, there's three very beautiful ways of developing that inner foundation. Satsang, which means to associate with positive-minded people who spiritually inspire us. Sadhana, which means to put some special time aside every day for our own personal spiritual practice. Prayer. Meditation. <clears throat> Yoga means to reconnect with the inner self. In our tradition, our primary practice is in chanting God's names. And Sadachar. <clears throat> Sadachar means to live with dignity, with character. There is a saying, 
If you lose your wealth, you lose nothing. If you lose your health, you lose something. If you lose your character, you lose everything. Another saying, you can tell how rich you are by counting how many things you have that money cannot buy. And that's the love, the peace that's within us that really cannot be affected by the ever-changing circumstances of this world. Religion comes from the Latin word religio, which means to bind back. Yoga means to reunite. Essentially, they both mean the same thing. To reconnect our consciousness with who we truly are. <coughs> And to learn that the greatest wealth, the greatest fulfillment is in seva, in serving. I'm so grateful to be with all of you. It's really strange because I cannot see Anything or anyone. <laughs> if, if any time during my talk it appeared that I was looking at you, <laughs> I may be looking at you, but I don't see you. <laughs> I'm really not accustomed to this. Can I see anyone? <laughs> Thank you very much.